Hey, good morning, everybody. Uh, I hope that you are nice, warm, and cozy on, on this uh, Sunday morning. And if you watch the sermon on some other day, I hope that you are enjoying your day as well. Um, so uh, if you're not sure I am, I'm Dirk de Villiers. I'm a member of, of uh, France Show Far. So um, uh, today I've, I've got the privilege of, of sharing the message with you. But before we do that, let's just open in prayer. Lord, we just want to say thanks for, for another day. Thanks that we can be here, and, and Lord, we just want to pray that um, that your message would really just creep into the hearts of, of the people that need it, and Lord, that if there's something in particular that you want to share, that it would just flow straight to their hearts, Lord, but if there's something that's of me, that it would just go on deaf ears, and I'll pray that in Jesus' name, amen. Yeah, so... Um, the, the message that I've got on my heart is it's just something that the Lord has been doing with me um, over, over a course of a, a couple of years, actually. And I, I just thought I want to share this with you. Um, the, the, the whole concept is basically I was, I was reading Bible through Joshua 4, and the Lord started speaking to me about the concept of building memorials. So I'll, I'll read the scripture, and then I'll elaborate on that. So... Uh, we pick up the story in Joshua 4, verse 4 to 7. So the context is the Israelites is basically traveling um, through the Jordan, the Ark of the Covenant, not Noah's Ark. The Ark of the Covenant was uh, in the Jordan River, and the river basically stopped flowing. So as they're walking through the Jordan River, the Lord gives an instruction to Joshua, and Joshua is being obedient, and, and he's you know doing the instructions. So that's where we pick up the story. So verse 4. So Joshua called together 12 men um, he had chosen, one from each tribe of Israel. He told them, go into the middle of the Jordan in front of the ark of the Lord of your God. Each of you must pick up a stone and carry it out on the, your shoulders, 12 stones in all, one for each of the 12 tribes of Israel. We will use these stones to build a memorial. In the future, your children will ask you, what do these stones mean? Then you can tell them, they remind us that the Jordan River stopped flowing when the Ark of the Lord's Covenant went across. These stones will stand as a memorial among the people of Israel forever. And while I read that, the Lord was speaking to me about it, saying, listen, but you should start building memorials. And, and the whole concept of this is to, to leave something behind that actually lasts longer than you would that can stretch further than your physical ability to witness because these pile of stones bear a, a, a really good witness it's a proof of that the river did stop because if you think about it a, a stone that's from the middle of the river will have round edges um, just because the way it is shaped so it's it is very recognizable that this stone came from a river so if you've got a pile of river stones that's quite big on top of one another you, you kind of would recognize, but this is not by natural means. This is not just, you know, something that happened. Uh, this was here on purpose. So it's, it's a really good, you know, sense of proof of the miracle that God has done. And, and I felt the Lord say to me, but listen, I know you don't have kids yet, but you will have some one day, and I'm really looking forward to it. But set up memorials so that your children may know of the miracles that I'm doing now. Um, so that you don't forget them, so that you've got, you know, this this whole concept of, of giving the message of your first-hand experience of God's miracles to the next generations as well. And and this reminded me of a teaching that I got from my dad when I was about 10 years old. My dad, amazing guy, um, he would he would give us a whole bunch of Bible teachings on a regular basis. After dinner around the di dining table, we would you know, read us a story, but sometimes he would even call us into the living room, get a flip chart, and he'll draw diagrams and go through histories, and, you know, we, and this is one of those flip chart teachings uh, that I still remember to this day, and God reminded me of this. I haven't thought about it for a while and, until, you know, you know, God put this on my heart, and, and basically it's this, the, the three-chair teaching um, is, I think, what I got to call it eventually. So uh, we've got chair number one over here. Chair number one is going to represent the person that is the, basically 
experiencing a first-hand experience from God, whether it be a miracle, whether it be just the internal, you know, thing from I'm experiencing God. This is this is chair number one. This is what chair number one would represent, the person with a first-hand experience of God's goodness, okay? Then we've got chair number two. Now, chair number two is the person that hears the stories of God's goodness and God's miracles from the guy that experienced it at chair number one. So in, in Israel's... Um, history, we would often see that there's a generation of people that experience the, uh, a massive miracle like the Jordan River opening up or they're experiencing the exodus uh, out of Egypt or, or something like this. And then and judges also have the cycle quite a lot. And then they would transfer the knowledge onto the next generation and then they don't necessarily have this massive first-hand experience of God's miracle. Then they transfer that stories onto the third-hand witness. Now, the third-hand witness is, of course, the guy who receives the message from, you know, a person in chair number two. So it kind of is like, yeah, well, I heard somebody went on an outreach and they prayed for somebody and a healing happened. I don't know what the guy's name was, but it did happen. You know, you can trust me on this, but it did happen. But like that story just doesn't have that same oomph as the this guy telling a story from a first hand to this guy. So, and basically throughout history of Israel, you, you get the cycle where the, the same love and devotion that these guys with the first hand experience did not, um, they did not transfer that same love and devotion through the generations as much to the point that a lot of the times it would happen that at the third generation or the, the third hand witnesses would lose their devotion and do what is wrong in the eyes of God. So my dad was giving us this teaching and he said, well, listen, I want to make sure that you guys have a first hand experience of God as well, because that is where relationship happens. That's where intimacy happens. That is the plan what God has for us, each person to be on chair number one. So the, the idea is basically this, that if you build a memorial, you're you're a person with a first-hand witness. You're a person sitting on chair number one, and you're building a memorial so that you can have a witness that stretches further than your physical ability because your physical ability can help people that is right next to you on chair number two, but a memorial means that you can set up something that bears a first-hand witness to generations further than you so that the third and the fourth and the fifth generation can still see it as if they're sitting on chair number two. So the point of a memorial is helping people from chair number three to chair number two. And then helping people from chair number two to chair number one is what we call discipleship. And I'll speak a little bit about that now. I just want to get a little bit more into the memorial thing because we can witness within our physical capacity, yes, but the memorial just it helps to also preserve the story and the facts and the details about it. So um, I ask myself, but what does a memorial look like today? If I need to now build a memorial for my family one day as well, like what does a memorial look like now? So just writing down a couple of things of what a memorial could look like. So the one is just a symbol of a cross. That's, that's the most common thing that we've got to help us remember something amazing that God did. Um, and that is, of course, dying on the cross for our sins and, and receiving salvation through, through God's grace. Um, and then, of course, raising from the dead. That's, that's what the symbol of the cross means to us. Then we've got you know, a, a memorial of, let's say, a mountain. It is a, a thing that helps me to remember that you know, God is the creator and he's massive. And also that is into the aesthetics. I mean, think about, you know, anything in nature, something like a sunset or a sunrise. Like, God is not just practical. Like, he's really much into the aesthetics as well. Um, another thing is, you know, a piece of art. Uh, a piece of art in your house could be a memorial. Um, my mother had a, a piece of art. We've had it in our home. It's still there today. Um, you might even see a picture of it popping up now. Um, so the, the piece of art is, is a visual representation of something that was prophesied over her um, a while ago, and, and growing up, we saw this in our house, and we could see it coming into fulfilling, at, you know, even to this day. So, you know, that was something that was really cool, building our faith as kids as well. And then I, I told my dad what my topic of my sermon, sermon was going to be and where I was going to read from, and he sent me this picture, which should pop up now. 
it would be cool if it's right there. Um, and basically, the, the picture is, it's a stone with Joshua 4 written on it, because they were, um, the church where I grew up in, we had a, a project where we had to buy a new piece of land and build a new church building, because the current one was too small for the congregation, uh, which is, of course, a massive project. So what they did was, a, a couple of the leaders of the church got these stones, um, which is river stones with Joshua 4 written on it with the words Delta Project, which was the project name of expanding the church. Um, and just, it's, it's a reminder of all the miracles that happened to make that happen because that was really an amazing work of God. Um, so yeah, that's at his front door. Um, another thing could be, it's, it could be a file that is saved in the cloud. Now, if, if you're watching a YouTube video, that is a file saved in the cloud. So We've got this really awesome thing that Shofar did a while ago was they got 25 people to speak about first-hand witnesses that they've experienced God do in their lives. And they recorded that, and there's 25 of them listed in a playlist. So if you go to the Shofar online YouTube channel, there's a playlist called Shofar Stories. And these are people that, that experienced God in such a powerful way. There's things where physics basically got broken. There's people that got healed from cancer. There's people that, um, I think the caption, uh, I'm not going to give you too much spoilers, so I'm just going to go for captions, is um, I think something like from drug addiction to pastor. There's, so there's literally something of provision, healing, breaking physics, and so forth. So really go and check that out. Uh, so click the link in the description below after the service. I'll remind you back then. But I mean, there's a link in the description. Go and check that out of first-hand experiences of people experiencing miracles. Um, on, on that note, there's another thing that we had at our house uh, growing up, which was just amazing. And I think this, this changed my life for, for the better. Is we had a tape of first-hand witnesses of missionaries from different countries. Um, the craziest of stories of God's protection and provision and how people came to faith uh, through things that my mind would definitely not come up with. Um, of, and, and it just opened my eyes for what God can do if you trust him and if you put yourself in a position where you trust him. Um, so that is something we listen to uh, quite regularly. Um, it had, I don't know, about 30 different testimonies on. Um, and then... Another thing, if you want to go a little bit more old school than a file on the cloud, is, is what I did, is I've got an uh, A5 book. And this is when the Lord said, build memorials, this is the first thing um, that I start doing, is we've got this little booklet in my house. Whenever the Lord is using us, whenever He's doing something, whenever somebody prophesies something over us, uh, we write it down in this book. Now, this is a different book from my, my normal um, diary that, that I do my Bible study in. This is written in a way that somebody else can read it. Uh, when well, my children one day, somebody that might have a bit of a downtime saying, what, you know, does the Lord still do miracles in this, this time? Um, and, and this is basically just a memorial of the things God is doing through me and my wife or to, you know, to us, to provide for us, to, to protect us. What, whatever God is doing, we write this down. Because then it preserves that memory, it preserves the story, and it can bear witness, you know, past, you know, just just where I am physically at. Uh, so what I would like you to do is, I'm just going to read one of the testimonies for you. Um, actually, I wanted to read it, but it's written in Afrikaans, so I'll, I'll rather just tell the story in English. I think that would be probably a bit better. Um, so... Uh, the most recent one that I've written in here is um, I was preparing for the sermon, and I was I was thinking, let me ask a couple of people to maybe share some testimonies with me so that I can kind of do something with that in the sermon. And I, I messaged this guy called Yaku. Now, uh, on my phone, it saved Yaku Locked Up. Locked Up was a youth event I organized a couple of years ago, nothing to do with the lockdown. Um, and this... <laughs> So I messaged him, I said, hey, listen, have you got some cool stories? Maybe send me a voice note or something like that. And he replied, he's like, yeah, well, you know, what's this about? And he, he's asking me a couple of questions, trying to fish out what, what's exactly going on. 
And, you know, we talk, da-da-da. And the next moment, I, I get this phone call from him. And I'm like, hey, how's it going? He's like, no, it's going well. I've just got, you know, a couple of questions. I'm like, yeah, sure. He's like, who are you? I'm like, oh, okay, we haven't spoken in a while. You know, I get it. Okay, cool. I'm Derki. I organize this youth event. It's like, I don't remember a youth event where I spoke at. I'm like, okay, well, you are the missionary from this specific country that I'm not allowed to mention online for his own safety. Um, he's like, no, I haven't been to that country before. I'm like, okay, well, like, who are you then? Like, I don't know. Um, so then we, we try and figure out, like, how do we know each other? And to this day, we have no idea how we know each other. But the cool thing is this. He was part of a missionaries organization um, in 2013, where I was in 2012. So we've got this direct link. Like, I did a whole year of missions work during 2012. He did a whole year of missions work in 2013 through the same group of people. So, I mean, we had this you know, instant awesome connection. And looking at his profile pic, I can't recognize him. Like, I don't think I've met this guy before, but I've got his number on my phone. And then I go through my phone, and I can't find the real Yaku Lockdown on my phone. I organized this guy for an event, so surely I must have phoned him at some point, but it's not there. So I'm still baffled to this day, but I'm just saying this is absolutely God, because what happened in that conversation was he was going through a time where he just needed some encouragement of, you know, just reconnecting with God and, and, and you know, getting his faith. He, he literally said, like, his faith is not where he wanted to be and where it was. And we could end up like sharing witness stories, the show for online stories. I even sent that link to him because I was, you know, I was talking to him about it earlier. And, and end up just praying for him. And it was actually such a magical moment of, of a miracle moment of God setting up a divine appointment through this weird means that we still can't explain. Uh, but that was what Yaku, not Yaku locked up, the other Yaku, needed at that point. Um, and I just wrote it down to document the story so that one day when Satan comes and say, hey, listen, you know, God doesn't use you anymore. I can go back and I can read this. And I go like, uh, no, actually, yeah, he does. Like, sorry. Like, here's the proof. He does. Um, whenever somebody is, you know, in a bit of doubt, does miracles still happen? They can read this. Whenever my kids go like, okay, cool. Well, you know, what has the Lord ever done for us? Like, the story of the family and, and where we got to at that point, that is where it is, you know, documented, written out. So this is, this is our first memorial um, that I really um, want to encourage people. Try and write this stuff down, not only in a diary that's your personal things that you don't want other people to go and check out, and somewhere where all of them are together. Because if it's in your normal diary, you know, it could be split up between different things and it's difficult to find it again. So, you know or file in the cloud, however you want to do it, get a pile of stones, you know, let God guide you in this. So, um, just, to, just to recap the, the moral of the story of the three chairs. We've got chair number one. This is where we want everybody to be. This is where God wants you to be, is experiencing him firsthand for yourself. If you are sitting in chair number one, God is calling us to witness and it's calling us to disciple. So helping people from chair number two to chair number one, like I said, that's through the process of discipling. Just some tips of what you can do if you're on, sitting on chair number one and you want to help people from chair number two and chair number three onto chair number one. Whenever you have something that you're trusting God for in terms of breakthrough in your life, maybe intentionally go to a person that may be at chair number two or chair number three and ask them to pray with you and trust God for that breakthrough. Because that means that when that breakthrough does come, they are part of that witness. They are part of that story. That is part of their firsthand experience. Um, whenever you go on an outreach or you want to go and pray for somebody, whether it's at church, at your business, at your, in the street, in your house, you know, ask your kids, come with, pray with. Um, you know, Sometimes we've got the tendency of ask, always asking the people that, that already have first-hand witnesses because then you know you've got the strong backup in prayer, you know. But ask people intentionally that may not have this experience yet in order to help them to get that experience so that they can grow in faith. And this is part of discipling. Um, 
So, and then another way of doing this, of course, is, um, you know, if you can help sending people on an outreach. Um, definitely is one of the biggest things in terms of my spiritual growth was there's a whole bunch of people in my life that, that helped finance my mission trip during 2012 and various other things. Um, when, when I was 15 years old, a schoolboy, grade nine, um, my dad said it's totally fine for me to go to Sudan on an outreach, which of course is not one of the safest countries for Christians in the world. Um, and there was a, a group of people that helped finance that, um, including my parents, but from other people. And that trip there was what gave me firsthand experiences of God as well that, that developed me, that discipled me. So if you've got kids and they want to go on an outreach, hey, I missed two weeks of school, but it was absolutely worth it in, in the kingdom perspective of things. Um, thanks, Dad, by the way. That was an amazing trip. Um, <laughs> and, I mean, it's... Helping people to go on outreaches, whether you provide the lift, whether you help with finances, whether you organize an outreach. Now, outreach is a place where there's heightened you know, first-hand experiences because you are focused on God and what He wants to do more than during your daily life because you set everything else apart you know, at home, at your workplace so that you can focus on what God needs to do. And then we tend to just experience this a lot more. Um, but it's not limited to going out of your town. You can even do this during a day. Take a day like out of your calendar and just go like, I'm going to go on a one-day outreach. God, where do you want to show? Where do you want to take me? Um, yeah, let, <laughs> let's just leave it at that. At saying what, ask God for first-hand experiences. If you recognize that today you're sitting at a chair number two, or you're maybe even sitting at a chair number three, I want to really encourage you. Pray and ask God. Say, hey, listen, God, I want a first-hand experience. Because chair number two and chair number three, when it gets tough, has the tendency of not being sustainable in holding on to faith as well. Whereas if you've got first-hand experiences, there's nothing. There's nothing that can hinder you or cause doubt. Because if you were blind, but now you can see. The Pharisees can come and say, but who's this man? And you're like... In, in which power, in whose name does he do it? Like they can throw anything. Was it on the Sabbath? You know, but if you can say, hey, I don't care about all these sideline things. I was blind, but now I can see. I know that I've received this miracle. I know that God has answered my prayer. So yes, he does answer prayer. Yes, he can do this. If you recognize you're at a chair two or three, I would encourage you, go to people that you know are experiencing stuff from God on a first-hand basis and ask them, Take me with you. Show me. Where do I need to go to get this experience? How do I get that? Ask God, reveal yourself to me. He wants to reveal yourself, himself to you. And especially if you're on chair three, go and check these YouTube videos about 25 testimonies of people with amazing first-hand experiences. And may this inspire you to have a lot of first-hand experiences in your life of God's miracles of God's power, God's love, and God's salvation. And for those that are sitting on chair one, go out there and witness to the world, because that's where we need it. Amen. Lord, we just want to say, you are an absolutely amazing, amazing God. Thank you that you are intentionally involved in every single one of our lives, and that you want to have a first-hand relationship with every single one of us. Thank you that you are doing miracles in our daily lives, Lord Jesus. Lord, I pray that we can trust you in boldness for more of your power and love and provision and healing and prophecy and word, just everything that is good that you want to give. Lord, and I pray for, for the people in chair number two and chair number three. Lord, I pray, would you reveal yourself to them so that they may have an undeniable first-hand witness of your goodness, your power, and your salvation. Amen. Amen.